All right, welcome to this lesson where we'll talk some more about how the brain works and how we can improve its functioning. The brain is this really complex organ that's at the center of our central nervous system. It contains about 85 billion neuron cells and as well as another 85 billion glial support cells. And every second, chemical reactions occur in the brain. So these cells communicate with each other through chemical and electrical signals. In the last couple of lessons, we tried to make sense of how does all this complexity work together. And we looked at the unifying theory of predictive processing, which says that the brain is basically a prediction making machine. It's trying to build an internal model of how the external world works and make those predictions as accurate as possible, minimizing the prediction error, the difference between what it expects and what it actually perceives, what it actually senses with your eyes, the ears, the nose, and all the ways that we take in information from the outside world. One inherent challenge for the brain is that it's trying to create a stable ecosystem for us to have the perfect you know, internal body temperature and amount of calories and energy and the right conditions for us to thrive and pass on our genes. And yet, and it's trying to predict, you know, how we can best operate in this ever-changing environment where things are just rapidly coming and going, sights, sounds, smells, the world around us is changing, you know, the, the weather patterns are changing, and in each moment, things are just always in flux. So in order to find the right balance and equilibrium amidst all this flux of chaos in the world, the brain needs to be finely balanced and tuned in a way where it's going to still act in a, in a way that will benefit us, but it's not going to be oversensitive to changes, and it's not going to grasp too tightly to things that it likes. So I'll give an example. We've all had the experience of being really annoyed by something, and often throughout life we get better at getting annoyed less. But for example, if your shirt's a little itchier than usual and you got really fixated on this and just couldn't stop scratching it and couldn't stop thinking about how annoying it was, it creates so much trouble for yourself rather than if you had the ability to just kind of scratch it and then ignore it and move on and be okay with the, the itchiness. And in that case, your brain would have been, had this very adaptive response that says, okay, the shirt's not perfect but I'm not going to worry about it anymore. Let's move on with life. And there's, in some mental disorders, this is what happens. People become so overly fixated on details or the, you know, the brain really locks on to things that aren't perfect. And also we can think about it in terms of addiction where the brain can just become really fixated on one chemical substance as the source of all of its happiness. And it tries to get all of its pleasure there. Another example on the macro level is when we have this fixed idea of how the world has to be. You know, it has to be this way. I, I simply will not accept it if, you know, this day doesn't go exactly as I have it planned. Or, you know, my beliefs are the only way the world works and everyone else is wrong. And this inflexibility causes us a ton of uh, agitation in the mind, and it's harder to get along with other people. And it comes from kind of a more macro version of those same rigid and kind of locked in models about how the world should be. So there's a great paper that I've linked to in the resources section that talks about a model of well-being based on predictive processing. And it says, quote, an agent that is able to remain at the edge of order and disorder will combine flexibility with robustness. Think of the boxer finding an optimal distance from the boxing bag where she is ready for all the relevant affordances the bag offers, end quote. So this is a brain that is ready to update and revise its internal model of how the external world works and throw out unuseful models. So let's say that you thought that you were right about something and then you got new information and you were ready to update your opinion and say, you know what, I didn't know everything I thought I knew about that politician or that subject, that philosophy. 
and I'm willing to admit that I was wrong and now I'm going to update my beliefs. At the same time, you don't you wouldn't want the brain's internal model to be too broad and over general. In other words, it just has no idea what's going on. Too ready to update its beliefs, believe any kind of conspiracy theory that it hears or on a micro level to get too relaxed about anything it notices and just assume, you know, nothing really matters that that I'm perceiving here. And on a micro level, we obviously, there are some things that it's important to react to. You know, there's people who have a devastating disorder where they, they can't feel pain. And so, you know, their hand might be on a hot stove, but they wouldn't even know to take it away. So, of course, we, we still want to be able to respond to the world in an, in an adaptive way. And this is like the boxer who's neither too close, new, neither too fixed in the, with the internal model, nor too far away, nor too broad in general with the, their internal model. In this sense, the brain can find a balance and really a balance where it's both fluid, but still has some good guidelines about how the world works and about what it's perceiving. In a way, in meditation, we're training to do this on a micro level because we train the mind to see that when it grabs after certain phenomena, like it grabs after a thought and it clings to it and it starts thinking about what it like worries about things that might happen in the future or regrets about the past and it's just running in these loops and even running repeat thoughts we start to train it to see that it can let go of those things and that it's okay to let go of whatever's flowing through the mind without always grasping towards it or pushing it away and that this is actually how Life can be more blissful when it's allowed to be fluid. And so using meta-awareness, we kind of train the brain in a sense to see that it's okay for things to be ever-changing, that it can't have a perfectly stable world, and that that's okay, that we're not going to fall apart, you know, that we're going to be just fine. And I talked in the training about this paper that proposed based on a computational model of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, that this is one mechanism for how it works, that meditation is training the brain to broaden its range of expected sensory information. Like in other words, let's say you're, you're just noticing that there's all these sensations in the body that are flowing, all these little vibrations and feeling tones and warmth, and it's all kind of just coming and going, coming and going, just like your thoughts. Well, if it sees enough of those kind of ups and downs and comings and goings, eventually it's going to think, well, okay, this is just how it is. I don't need to try to fix this situation. It's fine for things to come and go and flow in and out. And in this way, it seems to broaden its kind of expectations about how things should be. There's this ancient concept that's often attributed to Buddhist and Taoist philosophy of the 10,000 sorrows and 10,000 joys that we go through in a lifetime. All the ups and downs, you know, we stub our toe, there's a sorrow. We get an extra bowl of ice cream, there's a joy. And this just happens not only throughout a lifetime, but every day there's all these ups and downs. And even in every moment, there's things that feel good and then there's things that a moment later might feel bad. So by observing carefully, by stabilizing our inner microscope, as we've been doing in the meditation training, we start to see all these ups and downs, and the brain just gets less bothered. It's kind of like a, a, a wise old person who's just seen it all. You know, they've been through the depression as well as the, the booming cycles of the economy, and they're, they're not so worked up if the stock market goes down. This is kind of what we're training the mind to observe when we sit down and observe carefully how things come and go. You can apply the four R's throughout the day to recognize when the mind gets stuck on how things need to be. So anytime 
that something's bothering you because it's not the way you want it to be, you can recognize this. You can release, which is just kind of opening up your scope of attention and no longer fixating on whatever it is the mind is stuck on. And then relish is the third R, which is to bring up a positive state of mind. For that one, it helps to smile. It can even help to laugh where you kind of you kind of like literally shake up your body and your state of mind through laughter. And and then the fourth R is to remain. You remain in this happy state of mind being like, it's okay, you know, it's going to be all right. So your daily challenge is to notice how your mind changes by recording. And you can just do this in your mind, just kind of taking note of the different mood fluctuations. And so by training the mind to see these fluctuations in, in our moods throughout the day, they become less of a big deal. And we realize it's okay not to always feel good. And then we can kind of step back from it with meta awareness and make it just the way things are, always, always changing and unpredictable. Thanks for listening to this lesson, and I'll see you tomorrow for some more training.